Welcome to this episode of Portraits of the Landscape. My name is Tim Chapman, and in this episode you'll join me as I plan for and execute my trip to Iceland to photograph the Geldingadalir volcano from the air. This was not the first time I have photographed an active volcano in Iceland. In fact, I flew there in 2015 to capture the Bartabunga volcano that was erupting at Holoran. During that trip, I learned a lot about shooting an eruption, which would serve me well on this adventure. The first and most important lesson I learned was that eruptions are unpredictable and they don't last forever. Iceland's last eruption began in late August of 2014, a spectacular eruption of lava that lasted for months. Although I had just been in Iceland earlier that year, I wanted to photograph this rare event, so I booked a trip to shoot it in February of 2015 when my schedule had a hole. Plus, I thought the juxtaposition of shooting red-hot lava against a snow-white wintry backdrop would be ideal. I booked a helicopter and pilot to fly me the two-thirds of the way across the country to the location of the volcano. I wanted to shoot the eruption from the air with the doors off the helicopter. Now, in a place that charges about $25 for a standard meal of fish and chips, you can imagine what the cost of renting a helicopter and flying all of that distance was going to be. A significant investment. Sadly, the decision to wait months after the eruption began proved to be fatal, as the volcano had pretty much blown itself out by the time I got there. As we jockeyed above the crater looking for compositions of the weakening bowl of lava, I would learn my second lesson the noxious gas that a volcano emits. Volcanoes release a number of different gases. Some visible, and some, like sulfur dioxide, are invisible. But they're all nasty to breathe in. I spent 45 minutes in the air above the crater and sucked in more than my fair share of the fumes, and paid for it later on with a massive headache. Fast forward to March of 2021 and news breaks of Iceland's latest eruption on the Rake Janes Peninsula. I immediately looked into what was required to get into Iceland given that the world was still in the grips of the COVID lockdown. April 6th, the country would begin opening to visitors from the U.S. who were fully vaccinated. So I booked my appointment for the shot and then booked my flight. To determine the gear I'd need, I'd need to consider the type of images I was looking to capture. I call this my pre-visualization stage. The more clearly I think of exactly what I want to capture, the more I can list the details needed to achieve that. This plan helps me to improve my luck. The main image I wanted to get was an aerial that looks straight into the crater from above. Now, I'm a dinosaur, so I don't do drone photography. Instead, I need to be in the aircraft with my camera in hand. Now, in order to shoot from directly over top the crater, I will be encountering incredible heat. Heat also breeds turbulence. Plus, the gases, ash, and the steam emitted are all bad things for aircraft engines. If an aircraft, like a helicopter, stalls, it falls, as it has no wing and therefore no ability to glide. As such, I wouldn't be able to use a heli for this shot. Instead, I'd need a fixed-wing aircraft, a plane. A plane has a wing to glide away should an engine encounter a problem. The problem with shooting from a plane, though, is ground speed. A Cessna simply can't hover. Even the slowest plane still needs about 70 knots of ground speed to stay airborne. So I would have to shoot my image at a high shutter speed so that my images wouldn't be blurry. I had to compensate against that ground speed. Now my 6x7 film camera has a maximum shutter speed of only 1 400th of a second. And while that sounds fast, I would need a considerably faster speed to freeze the action from a moving airplane. As such, I would have to take my digital system for this shoot. To minimize the potential for stalling the aircraft and from turbulence, I would need to fly at a higher altitude and use a telephoto lens to fill the frame with the crater. As such, I opted to bring my 200 to 500 millimeter super telephoto zoom, as well as a 70 to 200 for my aerial work. I reached out to a few pilots to learn more about their aircraft and their skills and experience working with photographers. 
This gave me a short list to use to narrow down my decision once I got to Iceland. Logistics planned and equipment assembled, it was time to fly. Once I landed, rented my vehicle, I drove off to a rural airfield just north of Reykjavik to meet with one of the pilots. Haldor was a great guy and we immediately connected. He knew what I wanted and was confident he could help me get it. He had a Piper Archer, referred to as a low wing aircraft. Basically, meaning that the wing is lower on the fuselage, in layman's terms, lower than the windows. While definitely a capable plane, I questioned the sight lines and ability to shoot downward. Plus, the access window that you could actually open up and shoot through was very small. While not an ideal plane for the needs of my project, I thought I'd at least test it out anyways and go for an orientation flight over the eruption site. Who knows, it might work out well after all. We timed the flight to arrive at the site just before the sun set. I observed what topography was lit by the sun at this time, and also what was in shadow. I also looked at the size of the area, the location of the caldera within the area, and where the visual interest lies. The volcano began its eruption. It was not a sudden explosive eruption, but more of a slow, deliberate act. Hardened lava in the center of the caldera would crack, revealing the emergence of fresh magma being pushed up from deep within the earth. The cracks would increase, dissolving the hardened crust back to liquid lava, and once all liquefied, the lava would begin to fountain hundreds of feet into the air. Unbelievable. The liquefied lava that danced in the air was white hot. Amazing to see, but not the most photogenic as it would render a big blob of white in the resulting image. I would need to intentionally underexpose my shots to try to pull some detail out of the lava. Underexposing, however, would also mean that the shadow areas would become even darker and lose detail. My film gear would have failed miserably in this environment. I made a number of exposures to test my comfort of shooting and composing from the airplane. I needed sharp shots. I used my continuous autofocus and paid special attention to make sure that my focus point was exactly where I wanted it. The next challenge was determining the correct exposure. Three factors entail a camera's exposure. Aperture, shutter speed, and the ISO. Since I was in a moving aircraft and I wanted to freeze the action, the most important factor to consider was the shutter speed. I needed a fast speed to compensate against the ground speed of the airplane. When I shoot on the ground, if I am hand holding the camera, I generally will not shoot at a shutter speed slower than the inverse of the focal length I'm using. For example, if I'm shooting at a focal length of 200 millimeter, the minimum speed I'd shoot at will be the inverse or 1 200th of a second, or my photograph might be soft or slightly blurry. In the air, in a moving plane, I knew I had to increase this, because on the ground I'm not moving when I'm shooting. In the air, I will be moving at least 70 knots, so an increase to my speed by a factor of at least five times that would be necessary to freeze the action. So for example, if my lens was set at 200 millimeter focal length, I would shoot at least five times the inverse of that, or one one thousandth of a second, or I'd risk my shot being blurry. The aperture was not that important, since depth of field rarely comes into play when doing aerials. Especially, since in this case, I'm going to be shooting downward, and the ground, therefore, looks flat. I would open my aperture all the way to allow for as much light as possible to enter the lens. To balance the exposure, I set my camera to auto ISO. Knowing that the erupting lava was so bright, I used the exposure compensation to intentionally underexpose by one stop from the light meter, and then turn on bracketing to vary the exposure slightly between shots. 
I would also learn that during this test flight, you cover a lot of ground in an airplane. So I had to shoot in bursts when my composition filled the frame, as I could really only garner five shots or so before I was past my composition. We would then have to bank around and do another pass. I normally shoot from the ground, and with landscape photography, the only thing that is usually moving is the light. So I can take my time to find just the right moment and make the exposure. Burst shooting is foreign to me. It's not how I'm wired. The orientation shoot was important as it taught me many things. Firstly and foremost, that aircraft type wasn't going to work. I needed an overwing aircraft, like the type I used to skydive from, where the wing sits on top of the fuselage rather than below. This would increase the viewing shooting area dramatically. I also needed a much bigger window to accommodate my super telly. My pilot was great, following my directions exactly and using his skill to pitch his aircraft as needed. Plus, his reading of currents and wind direction was superb to give me the stability I needed. Fortunately, he made a few phone calls and arranged for access to a different aircraft which we could use for my caldera shot that I had envisioned. We tentatively set up a window to do the next shoot, but we needed mostly clear skies and low winds to have optimal conditions. Clear skies for the setting sun to illuminate the surrounding landscape and provide enough detail and shadows for dimensionality. We also needed clear skies for visibility and clarity of the scene. I also wanted to avoid high winds to maximize stability and to reduce turbulence. Iceland can be a challenging place when you want to have something dependent on the weather. I would have to wait four days for conditions to be ideal. Our next aircraft was a Cessna 172 high wing. A night and day improvement in visibility and working area with a much larger area to shoot from. It handled my larger lens without a problem. Stuffing the big lens out the window, the 70 knot wind pushed hard against its massive surface area, making it a real challenge to hold steady. Had a lens hood been installed on the front, it surely would have broken off in the turbulence caused by the side wind. To compensate for the added tension against the lens, I selected a shutter speed closer to 8 to 10 times the focal length, then started taking some compositions. It was time to get my shot over the caldera. For safety's sake, we needed to gain significant altitude. Since the eruption site is near Keflavik's International Airport, the pilot had to call the tower to get permission to enter commercial airspace. As we gained in altitude, I studied the composition of the caldera below. I didn't want to get my shot when it was erupting because the white hot lava would have taken away from the impact of the shot. Instead, I wanted to get it at the start of the eruption, when the crust was cracking to reveal the magma beneath. At this point, the magma appeared as orangish-red capillaries in the blackened core. And at that point, I was confident that the dynamic range, the difference between the brightest area and the darkest area in the shot, was enough to allow me to retain detail in a single image. As the eruption began, I started shooting. The pilot started a tight bank turn to minimize forward ground speed, at the same time pitching the aircraft to enable me to shoot almost straight down. My motor drive clicked away quickly, writing data to the memory card as I made each exposure.
The meticulous planning helped me to control my luck, enabling me to capture an image I had envisioned weeks before. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Portraits of the Landscape. If you did, give me a thumbs up below and share this link with others. I'd love to get your comments below as well. If you'd like to see more episodes, click to subscribe and or visit the video section of my website, timchapman.com.